Michelle Schumann. I'm the artistic director of the Austin Chamber Music Center. I'm here with Jeff Natal. Thank you for being here with us, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is one of the busiest men in chamber music. He just finished up. Um, you're the artistic director of the Spoleto Festival, but they don't really call you the artistic director. Aren't you like the, the host or something, kind of a, an interesting name? Yeah, they call me the dictator. No, I'm, <laughs> it's just a, a bunch of people. I'm, I'm uh, director of the chamber music at, at Spoleto USA, Doctor Theater, and we just finished... We put on 33 concerts and over, you know, 16,000 people butts in the seats in the last two and a half weeks. So it's it's one of the most unprecedented. Uh, uh, you know, we probably play for more people in two and a half weeks in Spoleto than we do the rest of the season playing 80 or 90 concerts around the world. It's an amazing place. Fantastic, fantastic. And of course, Jeff is with the St. Lawrence String Quartet, and I'm. I just am beside myself to have you guys at the festival. I've wanted you for 10 years. <laughs> so finally, oh my God. <laughs> we've we, worked we, it out. Uh, we're psyched, and we have, you know, it's ironic because for the last number of years, we sort of had summers as our vacation because mm -hmm. the season was so crazy, and it became that summers were even busier, so we said, start having kids and stuff, and we're going to shut down. So we're gradually sort of one or two gigs each summer, so we're thrilled that it worked out. Awesome, awesome. So uh, part of your program is a hide and discovery, and I want you to tell our audiences a little bit about what that's about. I'm really intrigued by it, and I'm excited to well, get on that journey with you. It's an interesting thing. Basically, what happens through the years, and this was when we were students as well, you know, the great Juilliard Quartet, Tokyo Quartet, they, Joseph Haydn is the best, the god, by far the, way better than anybody else for writing string quartets. Um, the problem is that our students and our audiences don't share that belief, and it's been the same forever. So you'll play a Haydn quartet, you'll think, that was the most incredible thing ever. Did you hear this? And the audience is like, zero interest. Um, so it's been a long, whether it's teaching or playing concerts, we're trying to figure out what can we do to get, basically have the audiences and our students share our passion. So that when the hair stands up on the back of your neck, from some incredible moment in Haydn that everyone's will be with us. And what we discovered is that um, I think Haydn suffers more than any other composer from inactive listening. So if you're not you're not actually paying attention, if you're letting it wash over you, you know, like at a cocktail party or grandma's house, and it works out. Classical period music, unfortunately, works. You know, they say Mozart makes you smarter, all that stuff. Yeah. Haydn, though, really suffers from that sort of Wallpaper. Uh, kind of wall, totally. Sonic wallpaper. If you're not listening actively, not following the plot, so to speak, then all the jokes, the storytelling, a lot of the stuff that makes Haydn great is gone. So the discovery is just basically a way to force people to give them little hooks, little windows. Hey, we're going to check this out. This is what happens here. Can you hear how this becomes this? And listen to what he does. He could have done this, but he did this instead. You know, just these little, little sort of sonic hooks so that when you then play the whole piece, um, they'll be with you and they'll laugh out loud mm -hmm. at the spots that Haydn would have expected his audiences to clap or laugh out loud. I'll never forget, and this sort of was, it, it was a really interesting moment. We played at a, the only all-female prison in Alaska, mm -hmm. and they had set up a string program. This is a wild gig, actually. We go there, you know, metal detectors, the whole deal. We play this concert for them, and we play a, a movement of Haydn. And they were just like laughing out loud, gasp. It was amazing. Like that's the audience we want. Mm -hmm. How do we get our audiences around the world um, to respond to this music in, in the same way that the girls in the prison in Alaska did, and how we do? So the discovery sort of came forth from that. And basically, what we do is we'll go through the piece, movement by movement, um, little things here and there, pointing out things that you can listen for and get and how it happens and then we play the whole piece and hopefully the experience of lis listening is, is better. So we'll see. Yeah, well we're really excited about that and you're also doing R. Murray Schaefer. Oh man. On that, yeah. And I'm a Canadian so I know R. Murray Schaefer. Oh you but are, yeah, no way. Yeah, um, but I imagine not very many Americans know of this uh, really cool composer so can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Yeah, Murray is... Um, He's a care. He's still with us, but he's mm -hmm. not in good health. Uh, but he was one of the seminal, groundbreaking Canadian musicians through the '70s and '80s and '90s. Um, and his his big thing um, is a lot of using space and time. And so he's had these giant outdoor pieces. I mean, Princess of the Stars is one. Um, out, you know, mountain lake at dawn with musicians on war canoes, and it, you know, it's a very. Uh, but the, I gotta say, 
um, it was magical to see this. So the third quartet, um, he uses the concert hall as you know possibilities of space. And so the piece begins with cello on stage alone. Uh, and then gradually the first movement is the quartet sort of coming together, um, unifying sounds throughout the hall, walking around. I mean, it's very, it's a, it's a 70s aesthetic, but it's really quite beautiful and incredible string writing. Great virtuoso cello solo. And then the second movement, All Hell Breaks Loose, um, and this was inspired by his working with Inuit throat singers, so you'll, a lot of guttural sounds. Um, so it's basically, he's sort of like a tennis player, you know, the tennis players, when you, you strike the ball, you, it draws forth a, a visceral grunt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is, you know, the act of making a really large gesture, a, a slidey gesture on the instrument, drawing forth similar vocalizations. So it's, a, it's both hilarious and visceral and quirky. And that's the second movement. And then the third movement, in total contrast, is super serene, still, unison, quarter tone thing. So your whole sense of pitch and harmony is a little bit lost, and it just drifts away. Um, and the, I get up and leave the stage. So the last is the first violinist leaving the stage. And he's written this, now he's up to 11, but the first six or seven quartets could also form one giant, one giant piece so that the second quartet ends with the cello on stage alone and so they can be linked together as one. So he's, he's groundbreaking in many ways, but it's, it's really inventive and fun and quirky and uh, virtuosic and all sorts of cool stuff. So Murray's a, you should read it. I think his book, what's it called? The Tuning of the World. Hmm. I can't remember exactly what it is, but he has great ideas about how we interact with, with music and, and theater. I sang something, a choral work years and years ago, and it's just, I mean, I, I love the way he uses texture and sound and makes it come from different places, too, so yeah. I'm, I'm really uh, intrigued. Really, I'm glad you uh, let us do it. It's yeah. great. It'll yeah. be fun. It will be fun, for sure. So now we have a few questions from our Facebook fans, so we can have some fun uh, with that. Um, uh, Judy Matula uh, has a great question. She said, uh, asked, what's the difference in how you experience music you play during rehearsals versus during performance? Huh. It's a good question. Um, well, you know, I always, you want the best of both. So I always try in rehearsal, unless you're, you know, sometimes in rehearsal you can just do really meat and potatoes. We got to do this super slowly, mm -hmm. no vibrato, just to see it if it's in tune or getting it to, so there's a lot of like clean, cleaning the engine work that goes on. Mm -hmm. But I always try anytime you do any sort of playthrough to try to have, to imagine the energy of a concert when you play in rehearsal. And, and so, and then, because the problem with rehearsal is no audience. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the main difference is that you're, you're playing, as soon as you're in a concert, you're trying to show the audience how incredible this music is. But you always want to think that way when you're rehearsing. Like, how can we make this not only sound good to us, but be meaningful and gettable, as it were, mm -hmm. to the audience? Mm -hmm. So the main difference is the audience, but you, you try to approach both in the... Um, basically, you have to be affected when you're rehearsing, and you have to always think about the whole reason we're doing this yeah. is to make the audience really get it. And can you talk about the, the energy of the audience and, and how you feel it as a musician on stage? Oh, it's, it's huge, and it's especially the difference between good and bad. I mean, you can tell, and the coolest thing is the difference between a totally silent hall with no people and a totally silent hall with four or 500 people actually listening to the same thing and really following it is shockingly palpable, and it's super cool. And the difference between a totally silent hall where you could tell half the people have no interest in being there and are just being polite and sitting still and thinking about their dinner. It's hugely different, and it's weird. And I don't know how you could scientifically quantify it, but it's really palpable. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes a live concert experience so much better. You know, as great as YouTube is for allowing you to have accessibility, there's just no way you can replace that feeling of, of the live concert experience. So that's why we do it. Yeah. Well, you, you do it, I, I assume, sure, right? Sure. Well, you know, I was just thinking about something that I heard that was totally not apropos to this, but someone was talking about the power of uh, prayer and the, the realization that maybe it's not the fact that people are praying to a higher power or whatever, but maybe it's just the fact that everyone is thinking the same thing and that there's something powerful in that. So if you get a hall full of 600 people and they're all like in that space feeling the emotion that is coming out of the music, 
there's something incredibly like there's an incredible energy with that and power with that too. Totally true. Yeah. And whether to, to see, and, and, and that's the power of music to, to, in a language that everybody understands differently, to have a whole crowd laugh at the same moment or mm -hmm. be, you know, emotionally moved to tears at the same moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an amazing thing, especially when it can affect people with no official training. You know, you have to have training. Right. You, just have, you just have to listen. Yeah. That's what people forget, I think. They think they have to, to become, uh, to be prepared somehow. No, uh, to be no not at all. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's yeah. the cool thing about it. Yeah. That's so a I, great quote by uh, Haydn, you know, when, <laughs> when Haydn was going first to London uh, in 1792, or, uh, and his last day in Vienna was with Mozart's close friend, and Mozart said, Papa Haydn, you know, how, how are you going to manage in London? You don't speak any English. It's going to be very difficult. And Haydn said, my language is understood all yeah. over the world. Yeah. And he totally knew. It's like, totally. Yeah. His, his music is all he needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our, our second question is a lot of fun. I'll see what you do with this. It's by Karen Richmond, and she says, uh, if you could play any piece for anyone, living, dead, real, or mythical, uh, what would that piece be, and who would you play it for? Oh, that's easy. Um, you can pick, everyone, would, sorry, that's hilarious to me because everyone's like, "Oh, that's really hard." <laughs> no, super easy. I would, you know, any you could choose any random Haydn quartet. I would probably choose uh, Opus Twenty Number Five or Opus Twenty Number Two or something like that, mm -hmm. and play it for Haydn. Mm -hmm. I would, I would pay real money for. I mean, that's that's a no, total no brainer. Awesome, awesome. Um, our next question is uh, by Aurel Garza Tucker. She says, "What was the moment or piece of music that made you want to become a musician?" Oh man, the problem is uh, I don't remember that far back. You know, it's uh, <laughs> I'm not even sure I am a musician. You know, it's like music is a. <laughs> it's not like a real job. You know, it's just mm -hmm. I, I remember. I remember being really passionate about listening to records as a kid, and my and. So those early days, my dad played, and I started playing sort of late, like eight, but I remember as a nine, 10, 11 year old being really into listening to Rachmaninoff, Piano Concertos, or Marriage of Figaro, and just being excited by that process. I remember going to the Messiah every year and thinking that was the coolest thing ever, and it still is. Mm -hmm. um, but there was not one specific time. I will say, I remember one specific musical moment that that transformed my passion for opera when I was a teenager. I heard it was Clyde Gilmore on Gilmore's album, CBC Radio. Mm -hmm. You being Canadian, you probably sure. remember CBC Radio. Um, <laughs> and he played uh, the Pearl Fishers duet, uh, mm. these days, Pearl Fishers, with Robert Merrill and UC Burling, the great mm -hmm. Swedish tenor. And I, it just totally, it hit me like, kunk. Mm. And I said, oh my God, that's the most incredible thing I've ever heard. So I, I from that moment, became. First, a big UC Beerling fan, mm -hmm. and that got me into La Boheme and Puccini, and then, I, so, and then my opera was like a virus. Mm -hmm. So that, that moment in time led me to become a, a passionate opera nut. Mm -hmm. um, the last uh, question that we have, it's probably the toughest one, or maybe it's not tough, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Alan Anbari writes, uh, why does classical music still matter today? And what would you say to someone who thinks a classical concert might be boring? Um, well, I mean, it's hard for me to answer because for me, it's like, it's like you're asking why is the air we breathe important for you? Because, yeah. you, you know, if you took music, in classical, it's an unfortunate term. I mean, I would just use yeah. music. For me, there's no difference between Merle Haggard and mm -hmm. Joseph, Joseph Haydn. Mm -hmm. If it moves you it's in a, and you like it and are passionate about it, it's good. So music as a thing is for me it's it literally well i'll take my sons and my wife ahead but it's it's almost like air i, I can't imagine existing without the ability to, to listen to play and to be part of, of music um and but and so the boring question yeah that's you got to pick the right shows you know i mean there are lots of boring concerts but there are lots of boring TV shows and there are lots of boring movies and there are lots of boring restaurants and there I mean you just you've got to you've got to be ready to be passionate in, in your listening and, and be willing to make that leap of faith 
and you got to pick the right concerts. Yeah. You know, it's it, those two things. So if you go into it thinking it's going to be boring, even if it's great, you might yeah. not really get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go into it really excited and, and go to a show where the, the players or the music is not interesting or, or they're not passionate about it, it's going to be a, a bad day. You could say that about anything. You know, you, you go to a really fancy restaurant, you think it's going to be great, and it's the Olive Garden or whatever, you know, some horrible, you know, it's, it's the same for anything. Right. Um, but, but the classical music in general does benefit um, because it's so layered and has so much to offer in terms of emotional journey, storytelling, surprise. It, it needs and benefits from active listening more than, say, a country and western show. Mm -hmm. that's, I, as, as much as I love great country music, um, and I've heard Johnny Cash live, it was transformative, it's amazing, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, the lyrics are interesting, the, 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 the tunes are very formulaic, powerful, but it, it, you can get away with just sort of being there and enjoying it. Yeah. It's much harder to get the same experience from a uh, Haydn String Quartet concert. Well, um, A, because in, in pop music or popular music or country music, it's so loud when you hear it live that it can well, like, that's, yeah, feel, that's, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that yeah, that's feeling. another issue. Like, yeah. good, good, um, it's really hard to find good venues that aren't over-amplified. Right. Anything, you know, anything too big. I, I remember being so disappointed going to see Dylan or Soundgarden. Mm -hmm. You just go and it was horrible because you couldn't hear anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but that's the same in our business. You know, you go to a shitty concert hall that's too yeah. big. Yeah. You know, you go to Carnegie Hall in the main hall and hear a string quartet, it's terrible because yeah. mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things have to line up for the experience to be really great. Yeah, I don't think audiences really realize how important that is a lot oh, of times. Oh, huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, we do, what we do is, I don't even know what your hall's like, but, mm -hmm. you know, what we do is so intimate and so based on these little micro moments that are super yeah. cool and improvisation. And, right. and that gets, if you play in a, in a thousand... 1500 seat hall it, it's just not going to happen yeah and what you'd said uh kind of draw me to just a last question uh, how old is your son you, you I said five and ten year old five and ten year old so music has been so important to you your whole life you don't even remember when you know that it became important how has music manifested for your kids and your life with your kids oh man you know uh, my son jack i love him he's a quirky crazy man but he uh, I wonder I, why I wonder where yeah. that from well I think though that the genes sort of passed him by I think it skipped the generation because mm -hmm. he has no ability or interest in music mm -hmm. it's really we tried you know he started on violin, piano and we tried cello and and both my wife and I are pretty passionate violinists mm -hmm. so I think it's a combination of for instance here in Spoleto I don't see them at all you know literally are gone so they hate it because mm -hmm. they don't see their dad yeah but I really believe music, unfortunately, is, it's genetic, you know, you got to have that gene. And I'm sort of thrilled he doesn't, because if you show ability and, and, and some talent, um, it's a tough choice for parents, because if you're not really locked in by 16 or 17, you have no chance as a life, as a performing musician. You can't pick it up when you're 20, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in a sense, I'm happy that Jack has no ability, because I would have had to make that choice Right now, as a 10-year-old, Jack, unless you start practicing a couple hours, yeah. two, three hours a day, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. so hopefully he'll have a real real job. I just hope that he <laughs> will be passionate about music in some way and have it part of his life, but yeah. you can't force it. You know, you can, you can open their, what is it, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right, right. Well, see, I have, I have hope for Ellis, my five-year-old, so mm -hmm. I hope he's... Uh, <laughs> find some way to have music be part of his fabric. Yeah, yeah. well, that's great. Well, we are so looking forward uh, to your concert on July, we are, you are the 8th. Huh? Uh, yeah. 8th, right. Yeah, and it'll just be a thrill to have you there. I can't wait to meet you all in person and see you. I've been big, big fans for a long time, so We're thank back. you yeah, so I was, much. I was born in, in Texas, so I'm coming home. No way. So. Where were you born? Well, I shouldn't say this because you're not. I was born in College Station. Oh, uh oh, oh. I can sing the Aggie fight song. <laughs> please don't. Please, no. please don't. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Well, we can't uh, wait to have you come home. So uh, have a great, great uh, few weeks, and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Okay, Good bye -bye. again. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.